Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be analyzing Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. I'm actually really surprised I haven't already analyzed him by now. I don't know what's made him slip through the radar, I'm not sure. Anyway, this is actually a patron request video. This is from AJF1. Thank you so much for the support. I actually have a couple of patron requests coming down the pipe for you guys. And if you subscribe on the Patreon, there's one of the tiers that actually allows you to pick an analysis that I give. And uh, it can be any singing subject. It doesn't just have to be a singer. It can be anything. And so in this case, AJF1 wanted me to do a side-by-side -side comparison because I did one of James Labrie several months ago. And I think he liked the format. So I'm going to do that again. Last week, I spoke about Bjork. And her whole thing was that she had a vocal injury that she mismanaged. And her career has arguably been more difficult. And her singing hasn't quite been the way that it was before her injury. Well, Steven Tyler is a totally different scenario here. In Steven Tyler's case, what we have is an example of him singing extremely aggressively with lots of aggression, lots of distortion, lots of rasp, having a vocal injury that doesn't have anything to do with his singing, having surgery on it, and then coming back after some rest and being just as good, if not better, in the future than he was before. So, there are always exceptions to the rule, and I want to say that I believe that Steven Tyler is one of those freaks that I've talked about in the past who is absolutely the exception to the rule when it comes to being able to have long-term sustainability of the singing style. There are people who can do that. And to preface this, in case you've never uh, seen any of my videos before, my analyses are based upon vocal health and what we know about sustainable ways of using the singing mechanism. That's the baseline of everything that I do. So I look at this completely objectively, and I take a lot of the emotional elements out of the performance because I want all of you to have a better understanding of when you look at the bell curve, which things are healthy for you and which things aren't over the long term. So in this case, Steven Tyler has done a lot of things that sit on the outliers of that bell curve, but he's managed to maintain his voice. You all that have watched my channel for a long time know that I have been pining and advocating for some kind of longitudinal study to be done on vocal rasp and vocal distortion to help us better understand the impact on the mechanism. Well, I have good news. I found out just the other day that CVT has actually submitted an article about distortion and rasp up for peer review so that's a good sign hopefully that means that we'll have some you know some legitimate science to back up some of these things in the, in the somewhat near future and if that happens you can prepare for me to expand on the subject more i don't personally teach vocal distortion and rasp so as a result i won't be dealing with it much in this video i'll be pointing it out but i won't really be analyzing it and since it's not my area of expertise, I probably would rather just defer you to someone who does know more about it. But as of now, until these studies are finished, we still don't have a consensus as to which ways are sustainable and which ways are healthy and which ones, which ways are going to you know, turn your voice into hamburger meat and which ones aren't. So I still say exercise caution when you talk about vocal rasp and vocal distortion because that's the safest way to go about it. And I want you to sing forever and I wouldn't want you to do anything that's you know, going to ruin your voice. Steven Tyler has had some magic potion of things that he's done that's made his voice last. And uh, I think you all will be very impressed to see how his voice managed the entire process of the surgery and came out on the end. And he's in this video on the right. He's uh, 66. This is amazing. He does a performance on the left, which is from a concert. And on the right is an unplugged performance. I think it's at like a drug rehabilitation clinic or something like that. And he's obviously 20 years older in the right videos. You'll be able to see some interesting changes. Uh, I went ahead and summarized. By the way, this is not a reaction video. This is an analysis video. I've already watched these. And I've already come up with some key points that I want to point out. So if you came expecting a reaction video that's not what this is so just wanted to let you know up front a couple of points that i found up front that i want to bring up that are relevant to the differences between the singing style before and the singing style after is later in his career he isn't using as much chord closure he's using more aspirate sounds more sounds that aren't you know like a speaking sound instead of you know having what we call the modal or the the, the speaking voice affect to it. They have an airier, wispier, raspier sort of affect to them. So he uses more of that in recent singing times, which is really interesting because traditionally less chord closure is considered to be more dangerous and unhealthy. Uh, he also uses a lot more of what we call speak singing nowadays, which means that some of his singing is more of like spoken relatively to the pitch rather than actually singing the pitches themselves. And then the third thing to point out is that in terms of the amount of push and the amount of force and pressure that he uses to sing, it's the same as back then as it is now. And so 
all three of those characteristics are things that would classically be considered destructive to your singing mechanism, but somehow he's managed to navigate it before and after the surgery, and it's pretty remarkable. In my view, Steven Tyler is a perfect candidate for some sort of case study as to how you maintain these singing methods throughout the course of your singing career. He's been doing it for almost 40 years now, so, you know, if anybody would have some insight into how it's done, he would, and I'd love to hear his perspectives on it. So what you're going to see here is I'm going to play a portion of the left video, and then I'm going to explain something to listen for that's different in the right videos so that way you can kind of have a compare and contrast of the things that are different about the singing technique. Before I get started, I thought about this and I just want to give a quick plug. I'm wearing this shirt in case any of you saw and didn't know what it is. Emmy Law Fairyland. It's a co-worker of mine. She's a singer-songwriter. She kind of does this like um, folk pop like indie sort of thing. Uh, she's an excellent songwriter. I've seen her perform many times. I actually tried to play Cajon for her once. At, uh, it was not very good, but I tried. <laughs> um, but she's uh, she's got an EP out, um, and, and her music is really good. So if you're even remotely into indie, like folk, anything like that, check her out. I just thought I'd give her a, a quick plug. She's a great friend of mine, an incredibly talented songwriter and singer. So, yeah, be, anyway, with that plug aside, let's go ahead and get into this uh, Aerosmith stuff, and let's see how it goes. This is amazing. I can't be right one Okay, so, by the way, I'm going to be pausing this a lot. Copyright reasons, I can't let things play more than 10 seconds or my videos get blocked everywhere except for literally North Korea sometimes. So I have to cut things. I'm sorry. Nothing I can do about it. Um, one thing to point out about his sound in the past, in the 90s, is that he sounds like he is using his voice a lot more. So what, the, what I mean by that is that when you speak your voice has kind of this affect to it. It has its own sort of sound that's distinctive and distinguishable. And if you speak and, and you take that speaking sound, you turn it into singing, well, that's what we would call well, singing with your speaking voice or something very close to it. And in this case, he's doing that very consistently. Now, you're going to notice when I play the same clip on the right, listen for the sound of his voice. Don't listen to the words. Don't listen to the melody. Listen just to the sound that his voice is creating. You're going to hear that it doesn't quite have the same presence. It's almost similar to if I'm talking, and then I started talking like this. You can kind of hear a similarity in that sense, that there's less voice on the singing sound. Check it out. I can't the right one First off, most of the time, as singers age, you hear them take the keys of their songs and lower them so that the range isn't high. The, the, one on the, <laughs> the one on the right is actually like, I don't know if it's a full semitone or not, but it's actually in a higher key than the one on the left. So I don't know how he's maintained his range like this. I'll straight up say up front, as a professional voice teacher, I have no idea how he's been able to maintain his range like that. Kudos to Steven Tyler. Really, like, definitely needs to submit himself to some kind of case study some, or something so that we can figure out how he's even been able to sustain his voice by and breaking all these rules, so to speak, the whole time. It's really remarkable. Another thing to point out is if you've watched my videos before, you've t heard me talk about placement. And so placement has to do with the resonators. In other words, the points of the, at the mouth where sounds are kind of reverberating and, and, and creating specific affects. So for, for example, if I used a resonator that was very frontal, if I went e e e the sound is very kind of buzzy, very frontal. But if I take that same E vowel and I go e e the sound doesn't have that brightness anymore. It has more of a dark sound on it. So what you're hearing is me taking the resonance and it being, rather than being in the front, I move it to the back. Well, one thing that you're hearing in the comparison of the two sounds is that the Steven Tyler on the left resonance is more balanced, which means that the sound is kind of, it's not too frontal, not too far back. So, e e it, that would be kind of like what we'd call a mid-mouth resonance because the frontal would be e and the back would be e e mid-mouth resonance. So you're kind of combining the sound of the front and the back together. On the right, nowadays, Steven Tyler is clearly using much more frontal resonance. And you can tell that because the sound of the vowels are much brighter. They have a, almost like a ringier, shinier sound. And it's not a better or worse thing. It's just 
the a way that he's approaching singing now is much brighter. And it, that could be why he's able to sing in high keys because brighter vowels, brighter embouchures tend to lend to singing higher pitches more easily. But that's not a 100% thing. That's a case-by-case sort of deal. But a lot of times, if you use brighter vowels, use more frontal resonance, higher pitches are easier to sing. So that's just some quick insight about what you're hearing up to this point. Let's continue. Try to walk through Okay, so when he sings the high note there, you can almost not even hear the phonation. He's kind of tilting his head back and he's kind of using an E vowel. When you hear the word pain, it kind of says E rather than an A vowel. And I think that what that does is he's overly brightening that vowel. So like I said a little while ago, when you brighten your vowels, what happens is it makes it easier for you to sing higher notes. And so without getting into the elements of the rasp, since I don't know how that mechanism works specifically, at least enough to teach it, it sounds like he's deliberately brightening his vowels to make the higher notes easier for him to sing. So that's what he did back in the 90s. Let's move to the present and see what he does. When I was going insane Trying to walk through So he does a similar affect in that he uses that very bright E and he doesn't lean on the A vowel. So the the idea here is that when you say the word pain, you say pain and the A is the functional vowel, whereas he's leaning on the E and he's taking, even though we don't really use the I vowel at all in the word pain, we kind of do pain. We kind of close from an A to an N, pain and we slightly hear the E sound, he's leaning on that E to give the brighter vowel, the brighter affect. So he does something similar. The difference in the right side here is that when he goes to actually phonate the sound, he doesn't put as much voice on the sound. It's just like earlier in the in the little clip we talked about it a minute ago. He's deliberately not putting as much sound on it. He's putting more of this like rasp distortion through. And it's probably because when you get older, your larynx doesn't quite have the strength and the stability that it does when you're younger. So it's harder to maintain phonatory practices. The larynx kind of goes through this transition. When you're young, when you're a baby, it's very malleable. It's, it's, it's made of car. Cartilage. So it's it's very malleable and it's it's similar like the soft spot on a baby's head when it starts out. Very, very malleable, not very resilient. And as, it, as you age, that larynx hardens and hardens. Now, this is men specifically. Women are a little different. But for men specifically, the larynx hardens and hardens to what it protrudes. You know, then you have the Adam's apple. It's, it's like you know it's stable and it's strong enough to where it can like push through the skin a little bit and that's that's the adam's apple uh and then as you age past a certain point it becomes brittle and so when your larynx is at its hardest and it's most stable is typically when men are considered to be at their vocal peak well in steven tyler's case in this first video he's in his like early to mid 40s that is basically the middle of the male vocal peak most of the time the male vocal peak usually goes like 32 to 55 around that range something like that well in the right video steven tyler's voice is way past its prime and i don't mean that's an insulting way i mean it just literally is usually by your early to mid 60s you start seeing some serious signs of of the larynx brittling and and it and one of the number one signs of that is that you don't get as much phonatory resonance when you make sound. It's why a lot of older men kind of have this quality when they talk, that like hairy thing, because their larynxes cannot maintain that same phonatory position that helps the sound reverberate. So that's probably a major contributor as to why he's making the sound a little bit differently on the right than on the left. I apologize that I've had to cut a little bit of the chorus and things. He actually said a curse word in the video, and I try to keep those out of these videos, so I apologize for that. Um, I wanted to point out on the left that he doesn't really have a lot of facial tension when he sings. and um, Usually when you see people using those really wide, open mouth embouchures like what he does, where he like puts his cheeks out wide, you end up seeing a lot of concurrent 
facial tension along with it. But you don't in his case. Maybe it's just something that he's learned to navigate really well, and he's able to manipulate those wide embouchures without creating strain. A lot of singers do struggle with that, though. When you really open your mouth a lot, a lot of extra muscles start engaging in the face, the forehead, in the throat, in the neck, all the jaw, all these things. And so he's managed to navigate that pretty well at this point. But I think you're going to see on the right, there's a little bit of a difference here. You're probably going to see a little bit more facial tension. Let's take a look, and we'll see. It's a pain. So it was kind of hard to see because of the way that the microphone was positioned, but you can kind of see that whole like wide embouchure he was trying to do was converting actually into stress and tension up in his temples and in the tops of his cheeks. You kind of saw him doing this thing. There's also uh, some tension going on in his neck. I actually skipped the section that showed that because I didn't show it on the left and it wouldn't be fair to compare the two sections. But one thing that I've got to say about the dude that's like been consistent obviously throughout his career, he's avoided the forehead tension thing entirely and that's something that so many singers, especially in rock music and in metal, have trouble like keeping that like thing from doing like that. Ah. Oh, I, I see it all the time. And I, I work on it with my students all the time. It's so common. But he's found a way to navigate that throughout the entirety of his life. And so little things like that that don't seem like much, those are the kinds of things that lend to a more sustainable singing career. Now, does that mean if you don't use any forehead tension, you're going to be able to sing till you're 70? No. Steven Tyler probably has vocal cords of steel, and because of that, he's able to take a lot more abuse with his voice than a lot of other people are. I would dare say 99% of people that would try to sing in this style are going to hurt themselves in the process of doing it over time. Maybe not immediately, but over time they will. He's refined his technique into something very specific that is distinctly his and it works. I'd love to physically know what he's doing to make it happen, but unless you spoke with him directly, there's really no way to know. Um, my analyses up to this point have just been basically built around you know common principles. Like if you if you came into my voice studio and you asked me like how can I sing a Steven Tyler song, I'd probably say well you can't. Not because you can't sing, not because you're not capable of singing the song, but if you want to have that same kind of delivery. There just aren't that many people whose voices can take that kind of vocal abuse over time and, and make it sustainable. So, you know, if you had a coach it, that we might end up having one day that can really legitimately teach you to use harsh vocals in a safer way, in a sustainable way, unlike some of these other people who claim stuff that isn't backed by science, you, you may be able to pull something like that off. But as of right now, I would say if you want to sound like Steven Tyler, caveat emptor, be very careful. So one thing to point out here really quickly talking about all that embouchure stuff that I mentioned before is your lip shaping has a big impact on how your enunciation comes across. The line of that part in the song is, let me read it, that one last shot's a permanent vacation and how high can you fly with broken wings. So when he sung how high can you fly, it was almost like it just went high can you fly. There was no distinction between how high because his embouchure was so wide that you really, I mean, how high, how, I mean, there's really not much of a way that you can move your lips back into a closed position to make the huh sound again. Because every time you make a consonant or a vowel sound, your mouth has to reconfigure itself. And so when your embouchure is that wide, it tends to mess up your enunciation as well. And that's why a lot of times when you hear certain singers singing really high and their mouths are wide open, you can't really hear the words they're saying because when you open your embouchure like that, it's very hard to make words clear. That's why typically in like the bel canto world, we try to keep your embouchures smaller, more, you know, more closed inward, like less horizontal and more vertical because by doing so, it makes it easier to, to you know, say words. So if I were using normal embouchures, how high can you fly? You, you can see that my lips can very easily close back in. How high? But if I go, how high? It, you just can't. It's not really possible without so much extra motion. So that's one of the things that the wide embouchure stuff can do. Now let's look on the right and let's see if he still does that now. Wings. 
So, you know, and, and he you saw him move his lips back in, and it was a little more pronounced. The how high was a little bit more pronounced, but he still has that same sort of affect where the embouchures are really wide, and it's hard to bring your lips in without they're that far apart. Now, if you paid attention to the sounds that are being created, again, on the left, you had a little more phonation. You had a little more like of a speaky kind of sound. And on the right, you have this raspy, almost speak singing sound. Now, you might think, well, what do you mean? Like, see, singing like he speaks, and then speak singing. What's the difference? Singing like you speak is if I go, ah, if I make a sound, then it's like, you know, my speaking sound on my singing voice. But if I went, ah, or ah, or ah, kind of like that, kind of in the general vicinity of the pitch, but making it more sounding like I'm going, ah, in a speaking way, that speak singing. And hopefully that makes that distinction clear. On the right, he's definitely doing more speak singing. On the left, he's doing more singing with a speaking voice. Now, you see a lot of speak singing in things like Broadway where there's more emphasis on the text and the singing doesn't matter as much. But if you take something like opera or bel canto, like speak singing is highly frowned upon because their goal is to like combine the you know, the, the singing sound along with the speaking, like the, the ability to make the sound beautiful and make everything clear. And that's kind of the, the goal. And that's one of the biggest distinctions that you see between like classical singing and contemporary singing is, is that approach to things. So what you're seeing here is on the left, there's worse enunciation slightly, but you have more presence of sound because there's more modal, there's more sound on the voice. And on the right, you have a little bit better enunciation, but you have a... a good bet less sound on the voice and you actually are starting to see a little bit of strain on the right you're starting to see him kind of tense up in his face and you're seeing his neck tense up a little bit but it's probably just a stamina thing as you get older you just don't have as much stamina as you do when you're younger and and i would imagine that he probably pulled through this whole show that he did on the right perfectly fine but it's still really really difficult for anybody of his age to sing concerts and to sing this aggressively that tension is partially being caused by, by all the force and pressure that's happening from underneath his vocal cords are doing this uh, kind of thing it hurts for me to even try to do that and he's doing that in both cases when he was younger and when he's older that kind of pressure that kind of push typically leads to vocal damage and you know like i said he's got vocal cords of steel but that is a very common thing that you see in like rock and metal singers that tends to lead to vocal detriment is that pushed sound he now as i said at the beginning of the video he has equal amounts of force and pressure on you know in both videos then and now So there, it's very subtle, and if those of you with like perfect pitch or super well-trained ears are probably going to be able to hear this, but he bent over, straight down, and when he held that note out for a long time, the pitch's stability was very wobbly. He kind of reached up the note, and then it went a little flat, and then it kind of went right back up. Well, that's a perfect indicator of the kind of thing that happens when you don't have good breath support. And uh, in his case, a breath support was inhibited, I believe, by his posture. When you're leaned all the way over, what happens is your rib cage collapses inward. And when your rib cage collapses inward, your diaphragm can't really allow the rib cage to expand out when you breathe in. And so you don't have as much support from the mechanism as a whole. Now let's take a look on the right and see if he has those same problems. I don't think so as he's sitting in a chair. It's probably going to be a little bit easier for him to manage his breath support, ironically enough, because typically sitting gives you worse breath support. But let's take a look. It's not a destination. So in the case on the right, he actually just doesn't hold the note that long. And so if you don't hold a note for as long, you don't have to have as much breath support. Now, he does have this kind of like cramped in posture like this, and that just blatantly pushes the rib cage inward. Like I've said, Steve, Steven Tyler here is breaking so many of the rules of singing throughout this that it's really hard to approach it from like a classical analysis at all just because these are the kinds of things that if a student came to me, I would fundamentally be trying to break these habits. Now, I've heard both sides of the coin here. By breaking the habits, you're not letting the student express themselves completely, and in so doing, you might be limiting them from being the next Steven Tyler. And the the the, the answer to that is very possibly yes. Um, I am my personal approach. This is not this is not to be everyone's approach. This is my personal approach. My personal approach is I want to stick to the bell curve. I want to know that when I teach a student and they walk out of my studio, I taught them healthy things. 
And even if we come up with a way to do this kind of scene that Steven Tyler's doing consistently, healthily, and sustainably, I will still teach what I know conclusively to be healthy. And if I don't know how to teach this style in a healthy way, I won't do it. So I want those of you who are watching this video to take away this point more than anything. I don't like trying to be the exception to the rule unless I know that I have a safe baseline. And what I mean by that is I like to instill fundamental, safe, healthy habits in my students and then let them roam free with their voices however they want. A lot of times, in cases of people like Steven Tyler, they go the opposite. They make whatever sound they want, and they damage themselves, and then they try to go get help for it later. A lot of times when that happens, it's too late. There are some vocal injuries that are fixable with rest, and you know you don't have a problem if you just rest and you get you know voice therapy, that kind of thing, but there are some vocal injuries that cause permanent damage. And it's not fair to singers to sell themselves short, in my view, because they don't know what they're doing could potentially cause that kind of harm. So I tell my students, I'm gonna teach you the healthy way, I'm gonna teach you the safe way, then you go be Steven Tyler if you want to, as long as you know what it feels like to do the safe and healthy stuff and you can go back to it if you want to. That's kind of my whole approach. So there you actually heard him take the lower note in the harmony. I don't know if that, the other note was piped in or if someone else was singing it, but there was definitely a note singing, someone singing the higher note there. So I don't know if that was something they planned out ahead of time, but typically when you hear a singer take the low notes on something, they're trying to give themselves a rest. So it could be that he's getting vocally tired. You are starting to see some more signs of facial fatigue. You're seeing a lot more facial tension it kind of in his in his eyebrows and in his cheeks than, he, than you were before. So he's probably showing some signs of vocal fatigue at this point. So he could have just been trying to give himself an easier note to sing to sustain himself for later. That's like a business decision. You'll hear a lot of singers do that where they're like alter their melodies to make it easier on themselves. Like if they don't feel like they have a note for a show, they'll say, okay, well, I'm gonna take the low part that I wrote separately. So if you ever go to a concert for your favorite band and the singer sings a melody that's not the same as what you're used to them hearing, that's probably what they're doing. There's probably vocal rest and fatigue reasons for that. They're trying to save themselves. So, you know, don't fault them if they don't sing the line exactly as you know it. They're just making business decisions. So there he went for the high note, which is interesting. It actually indicates that he probably is less fatigued in the right than in the left. But he did put more of that ah kind of sound on it. And, I, and you, you, you distortion rasp guys probably know what that sound is classified as. In my study and what I've always known, that's not vocal fry. Vocal fry is like down here like this. This is the vocal fry sound. So I don't, you know, you might guys might classify that as fry. I'm not going to begin to be an expert on that subject. You can probably say in the comments what that, what that actually is. Um, but but he did take the high note. He just, again, like in, like in the comparison before, he didn't put a lot of voice on the sound. There was an implication of a note, but there wasn't quite that full-bodied sound of him singing. And so the biggest thing that is the difference between him back then and now is essentially what you would typically expect out of someone who ages normally with healthy, normal singing. As you get older, there's less weight on the sound, and that just happens because the mechanism's a little bit weaker than it was. The larynx isn't as strong, and the folds aren't holding together as consistently as they used to. The speaking sound is created by chord closure. When your vocal cords close, that's what effectively creates the singing sound that we know and we love from people. And so when you don't hear that as much, the chords aren't fully closing. And, and like, you know, more brittle larynx because it's getting older, you're not going to have the same fullness and sound. So remarkably, after surgeries and after this rough, ragged sound of singing for 40 years, Steven Tyler's voice has just degenerated in the normal way as if he'd never been doing this. So I don't know. I don't, I'm consider me stumped. If there's ever been a video that I made where I'm just stumped on how he does it, I'm stumped now. He's a one of a kind. You aren't going to find many people who does this. I mean, it's really, really rare, super talented stuff. He's doing a really nice job of just not having a lot of tension on the left. You watch his face. I mean, it's just generally not tense, especially when it's in the middle of his voice. The only time you're really seeing tension on the left side when he's younger is when he's singing in his higher register. And and that could be the key. Maybe maybe the whole key to him being the type of singer that he has been and been as sustainable is that most of his singing technique has not had a lot of strain muscularly. Now it's had some push 
in that he's been really eff forcefully pushing the sound from underneath, but he hasn't made that push manifest through physical things in the muscles above his throat. And that could have a lot to do with it. It could just be that he's been a relatively relaxed singer. And there is something to be said for that in and of itself. When I um, when I was in college, I did a brief study on Pavarotti, and one of the one of the number one things about Pavarotti singing was that he just didn't have tension. It didn't matter how much he was working to make the sound; there was no tension. So that could be that simple. Steven Tyler relatively used less body tension. He used a lot of force and pressure in the voice. He didn't use a lot of tension outside of his vo voice itself. That's my best guess if I had to you know, give an educated you know, estimation of it. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah, same thing. You just really don't see a lot of tension. There's more tension in the right, in the face than there is on the left in the neck. You, if you go back and there's a couple of times you can kind of see this sort of working over, you know, this little muscle right here working a lot. But generally speaking, just generally free sound for the most part. And I would say that that's a hallmark characteristic of his sound because he carried it through, you know, the whole of his career. That does not mean that he doesn't sing with push because he does sing with a lot of push. But he definitely has not had a lot of body tension in his singing. So there's a lesson to be learned in that for sure. Your voice is probably going to last a lot longer and be a lot more consistent if you don't tighten everything up when you sing. And maybe that's the key to all of this. Maybe the key to doing all of the harsh, rough stuff is just not tightening everything up above. That could be it. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm just telling you what I'm speculating based on what I know. And that's really it. Uh, there's really all just instrumental. There's one more little singing line that he does, but I mean, it's more of the same thing, so I didn't want to be too redundant. That's it. So hopefully this gives you some insight into a lot of different things. How the voice ages. Um, how there are rare cases of people being able to sustain this rasp stuff for years and it not affect their voices. At least not overly so. You can kind of see how the wide embouchures affect the sound. You can see how a lack of facial tension is, co is consistent throughout his career and it's probably a very, very good thing. I would not deem Steven Tyler's sound as the model for sustainable, healthy vocal technique. I do believe he is the exception to the rule. And my whole philosophy is if you go into singing thinking you're the exception to the rule, then nature is going to tell you otherwise. So if you want to try out singing this way, great. Please feel free. Go for it. But don't set this as your baseline of your technique because you may end up getting in trouble for it. You're more likely to get in trouble, I should say. So... That's it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you again to AJF1 for the Patreon subscription. We have another Patreon request coming up next week. I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. Uh, I may make another video or have a live stream later in the week. I'm not sure yet. Haven't figured that out conclusively. I want to start making two videos a week, but things just haven't quite panned out that way. Uh, I do have a new way for you to take voice lessons for me, though. There's going to be a link in the description, and I might put it down in the comments as well. And It's just a button you can click on if you want to book a lesson with me. And If you are interested, just click on the link and sign up. You do get a free consultation if you sign up for a lesson. So If you are interested in taking voice lessons with me, click on the link, sign up, and set uh, the one hour lesson and we'll make that your consultation and we will go from there and uh, I'd love to work with you if you are interested you know I do have a classical background but I do teach multiple styles of singing I don't just teach bel canto you can just rest assured that whatever I do teach is going to be based in fundamentally healthy principles and habits I also have a patreon as I mentioned at the beginning if you want to get involved and you want to tell me what to do and tell me what videos to make feel free to subscribe I'd love to uh, have you we also have a discord server which I've actually closed off uh, for only patrons, not because I don't want everybody in there, but just because there have been some things that have popped up recently that have made me think that maybe it shouldn't just be completely open to the public. So uh, the patron level is like the base level of Patreon to get into the Discord. So if you do want to get into the Discord server, uh, join Patreon. And uh, that's it. So if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Let's start a talk about this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Steven Tyler. You could probably inform me a little bit more about his vocal background than I know. Uh, I've listened to Aerosmith on and off throughout my life, but not super extensively. Um, so yeah, let me know how it worked with him. Let me know how his voice has panned out. Let me know if he stayed relatively consistent like like it seems like he has. I know he had some drug issues, but, but has his voice actually stayed consistent like this all through his career? Let me know. All right. Take care, y'all. See you next week. Bye.